but it is that what I so, are there any questions on what we did Friday talking about the gradient and its significance? So, what, what, what do you, what's these key points from Friday that you come away with remembering? If, if it hadn't had a weekend in the middle to remind, to destroy your memory. The gradient is perpendicular. To the gradient is perpendicular to level sets of differentiable functions. Gradient's point in the direction. Yeah. Uh, greatest rate of increase, or if, if you think of the function as being graphed at a given point, it tells you the, the gradient points in the direction in the xy plane in which the hill goes up steepest. And the magnitude of the gradient tells you the greatest rate of change, namely the slope at which you're heading uphill the steepest. Okay, so I now want to talk about uh, one of my favorite applications of this stuff that is supposed to be, although it's a poor representation, it's supposed to be an ellipse. And for purposes of today's discussion, an ellipse is, we'll make it sound fancy, is the locus, nothing to do with flying insects, of, <laughs> points P so that the sum of the distances from two fixed points, hereby called F1 and F2, is constant. So you put two points in the plane, you put thumbtacks at those points, you take a string of a fixed length. I can find a string that changes length. Well, you're out of order. <laughs> <laughs> you take your string and you attach its ends with the thumbtacks at the points F1 and F2. So your string then has some, here it's pinned down, and you can put a pencil and push the string so that you've got the string taut, and that would be where your pencil point is, for example. There are actually machines that are built to do this. Carpenters actually use them in some form or another. And now the locus of points P as you move the pencil around is going to trace out the noise. So this length is always fixed. If you change the length of Nick's string, what happens to this curve? But the points are not changing. So the F's here are called the foci. That's the plural focus of the ellipse. So if you vary the constant, you're getting what are called confocal ellipses. The foci stay the same, the ellipse changes, so they have they share the same foci. So varying the constant gives confocal, meaning sharing the foci, ellipses. Now, this is probably not the definition you guys have ever seen of, a, of an ellipse. How many of you have seen this before? What have most people seen? Over x squared over a squared plus y squared over b squared equals 1. Anybody else seen anything else? Alternative. Someone might have at some point referred to to ellipses and hyperbolas and parabolas and circles as being conic sections. Why are they called that? Because if you slice a cone directly, you can get an ellipse. Yeah. So if you actually take a cone, which Cameron's been thinking about a lot lately, and you slice it, if you 
depending on the angle that the plane makes with the cone, you get the various types of conic sections. A circle is just an ellipse that has this focus in the same point. Right? Correct. And I, hyper I had a hyperbola, this plus changes to a minus. So if you are interested in understanding how these three definitions all interact with one another, I refer you to some of the challenge problems for this week, for problems in the book which are on the list of challenge problems which you can do and which will show you how you get among these. This one is absolutely fascinating. There's a picture in the book, I don't know if any of you participated in the UGA math tournament something like three years ago. But there, one of the questions on the tournament had a solution for which understanding the proof of this would give you the solution to the problem, and our t-shirts had a picture of the proof of this theorem as the picture. So that you can see the picture to which I refer on page 108, number 9. So I'm not going to I'm not going to go through these different definitions. We're just going to work with this one today. Um, what I want to prove is what's called the reflectivity property of the ellipse. And the analog for a parabola is another one of the challenge problems. It's not very hard, actually. But it's the, the analog for parabolas is how they make your headlights work in cars. And flashlights work by the same principle. There's a reflector that's parabolic. And the bulb goes out of focus. And then taking the analogous definition to this that works for parabola, you can then prove the end of version of what I'm about to do for ellipses. So what the ellipse statement is, is if you take a ray of light and shoot it out of focus one, it hits the ellipse, which for purposes of discussion is made out of a ref perfectly reflecting metal. And light behaves how? When it reflects, it does what? Down to the same angle of angle of incidence equals angle of reflection. Remember that. So the amazing thing then is going to be that when it reflects, making angle of incidence and angle of reflection equal, the ray goes right back to the second focus. So that's what we're going to prove. So how do we translate that physics into the ma into math terms? What are we saying about the say the vector from f1 to p and the vector from f2 to p? Hmm? They end up at the same place. No, no, no it's not all right. <laughs> yeah. What it, what does it mean to say these angles are the same? Angle and angle is you get to you can take it. So the, the vector from each focus to the point, the two vectors make the same angle with the tangent line. Close, but not quite out. Okay, so this is what this is the property that we're going to try to prove. So, Alex mentioned the word gradient. Where is the gradient in this picture? It is perpendicular. No, it's perpendicular. So, what gradient of what anyway? <laughs> gradient of the function. This function. Yeah. So let's let f of x be the function that computes the sum of the lengths of the vectors from the foci 
to x. Then the ellipse, I'm leaving room because I want to write one more thing. The ellipse is a level curve of f. Now, how can I write vector from one point to another? Subtraction. 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 That would be helpful. So vector from f1 to x is the same as? Origin of x. P minus, oh wait, yeah, p minus f1. Oh, no. So, so from f1 to x, to x, you go to x, and then you subtract the vector to f1. Yeah. Okay. So the ellipse is a level curve, therefore the gradient of this function is, by what we did Friday, Perpendicular. perpendicular to the tangent line, right? So gradient of f at x is normal to the ellipse at x. Okay, so here's the gradient. Hmm? Or is it the other way? Well, actually, as you make this constant bigger, the ellipse grows outward, so the gradient's pointing out. You'll see it another way in a minute, Dan. So that's the gradient. So that's the direction you want to move if you're at this point in order to instantaneously increase the sum of these distances at the greatest rate. And you do have a homework problem in the book relating to a ladybug or something that relates to this. Hey, at least it's not an ant. <laughs> so look, f is the sum of two functions. sum of f1 plus f2, where little fi is what? The distance from The distance from x to focus sub i. So what's the derivative of a sum? So what's the gradient of a sum? Some of the gradients. Some of the gradients. Now tell me what each of those gradients is. F one minus x with a magnitude of f one minus x close. There's a negative. Right. Negative, isn't it? So you're looking at distance from a point f one <coughs> to x. So the origin might be over here, but as far as this function is concerned, you're thinking of f1, say, as your origin, and you're looking at distance from, your, from the origin. So temporarily, we borrow the anteater and we put it in that focus, right? And to make Tim happy, there's the purple anteater. So what's the gradient going to be? Well, it points in the direction radially away from the anteater, and its magnitude is? One. So gradient of f sub i is a unit vector in the direction from f, capital F i to x. So it's the vector x minus f i divided by its magnitude. So let's draw a new picture so that I don't have to mess with that one again. So here's f1 going to x. Here's f2 going to x. So let's color code these guys. Oops. Let's say this vector is brown. And let's say this vector is red. 
What does the gradient of little f1 look like? It's a unit vector pointing, pointing in the same direction. Pointing in the same direction. So this is gradient of little f1. And similarly, gradient of f2 is a unit vector pointing radially outward from the direction from f2. What happens if we add two unit vectors? This goes back to homework week two. What happens if you add two unit vectors? Oh, oh the, the they become bisector. You get it. Yeah. Some bisects the angle. You proved that in homework. If you didn't, go back and do it again. It's not a unit vector. It's man, isn't it? No. Triangle inequality says the only way you can add two unit vectors and get a no, you can't no, do that. It's a it's a <laughs> Quiet, Nick. Isn't it? You can do it in one case. When it's an equilateral triangle. Yeah. So it would be right. But in general it will not be a unit vector. So the key thing here is that these angles, alpha 1 and alpha 2, are the same. So recall that the sum of two unit vectors bisects the angle they form. So if we let alpha sub i be the angle between gradient of f and gradient of f sub i, alpha 1 equals alpha 2. Meanwhile, back at the ranch, <laughs> there was the tangent line. <coughs> And we were asking, what question? Um, um, the, the angle we were asking if the these angles matched, right? Mm -hmm. So let's call this angle beta 1 and <coughs> this angle beta 2. And the question we ask ourselves is? Selves. Selves. <laughs> If beta i are the angles between the vector from the focus to x and the tangent line, is beta 1 equal to beta 2? That's the question. So I'm going to say the answer is right in front of you. So yes. you know that it's a 90 degree angle between the gradient and the tangent line? So we do know, huh? we do know that this is a right angle. So then both of those angles between the gradients and the tangent line are 90 minus alpha. So, so let's opposite. see. Those are, back. They're parallel. those are opposite angles when you take two lines. So this angle here is beta 1, and this angle here is beta 2. And they're equal because they're both 90 minus They're both alpha. the complements of the alphas. Mm -hmm. Ah, but beta i is pi over 2 minus alpha i. So alpha 1 equals alpha 2 implies beta 1 equals beta 2. End of proof. So you could say I cheated because I took the angles coming from the foci and showed they were the same, whereas the question was if you took the physics question and shot the ray of light and it reflected knowing angle of incidence equals angle of reflection, it would reflect to the other focus. Well, there's a unique 
such solution and we checked that the lines from the foci had that property, so that's what has to happen. Okay, so you do have the ladybug problem which you're supposed to do moder modifying this discussion using the chain rule. And then there are these various challenge problems which will allow you to explore different things with conic sections if you're so inclined. Any questions on this? Okay, so I want to do a, I want to show you another problem that will allow you to use what the geometry what the geometry of the gradient is. And this is also similar to a homework problem. Okay, so I'm going to write down some crazy looking equation. Suppose f is differentiable. Suppose you have a function on the plane that's differentiable. And this funny partial differential equation shows up. So at every point, if you take x squared times the partial with respect to x minus y times the partial with respect to y, it adds up to zero. I did something similar to this with minus y and x or something like that. So this is a little different. I'll be shocked if anyone in here can actually look at this and tell me what solutions this has immediately. I certainly can't. You could try to guess. <laughs> you could try to re reverse engineer the chain rule and, and try to guess it. But yeah. So if you're bored, I'll let you do that while I'm doing it a more methodical way. Let's interpret this similarly to the way we did the problem a few days ago. Let's interpret this now as a dot product of the gradient with somebody. Gradient of f at the point x, y, dotted with whom is zero. X squared. Everybody agree with that? So what does this tell you about this vector relative to the kinds of stuff we've been talking about? It's orthogonal gradient. I know that. It's <laughs> So what do we know about the gradient? We know that the gradient is perpendicular to a level set. Therefore, what must be true about the vector here? So it is what to the ta to the level set? Tangent. Tangent. So to screw that one up. So this vector here x squared y is tangent to the level curve yeah, negative x squared minus y. Negative y, thank you. Through the point x, y. For every x, y, that's true. So most of you in this room should know how to find what the level curves are. You just aren't, haven't thought that you should know how to do that. Those of you who did the BC calculus did stuff similar to this. It wasn't couched in these terms, but you did something similar to this. What does it mean to say that this vector is tangent to the level curve? Well, I must know the slope of the level curve, mustn't I? If I know that vector and it's tangent to the curve, don't I know the slope of the curve? Yeah. What's the slope? Negative 
Rise over run, right? Rise, run. How does this enable me to find what mystery curves I have if I know there's slopes at every point? Gradient is not the right word. It's a differential equation. Yeah, it's dy dx. So if you say I'm looking for the level curve, by saying y is some function of x, then the slope at the point x, y, which you would really, in your prior calculus existence, write dy dx, the derivative of this unknown function, gives you the slope, is equal to minus y over x squared. Now, with perhaps the exception of those of you who had Dr. Azoff last year, <laughs> um, everyone should know how to solve this. <laughs> Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> well, I always do a, a week of differential equations in that course. I don't know if you guys did. We did a problem. Yeah, we did these problems. Okay. But how do we solve for the function that has this? Separate variables. Yeah, the, Officially, you're doing chain rule. Yeah, he said, do it anyway. It's not right. <laughs> so if you have dy dx is negative y over x squared, you want to put the y on, together with the dy and the x is together with the dx's. That's called separating variables. And what would I get? Ooh, I don't like over dx's. Remember, I want to think about something that I'm going to want to put an integral sign by. 1 over y. Minus 1 over, there's a negative or something. Yeah. And then 1 over x squared. And if some of you are, are, were trained to be more pedantic and really want to know what's going on here in a, in a more careful way, I'm happy to show you that in office hours. So now I'm going to integrate both sides. What's the integral of dy over y? Of course, we're, we're adults now, so we call it log. Log of absolute value of y. Okay, very good. <laughs> <laughs> Bonus points. <laughs> Wait, why don't we just log? Equals, what's the integral of negative x to the negative 2? Negative x. Uh, whatever x. Minus 20 points if you don't say something very fast. Plus C. Plus C. Yeah. Yeah. Minus 20 points. <laughs> <laughs> it's a grade in the class if you don't mention it. <laughs> All right, so what are the level curves? Well, they're curves on which this equation holds for some <laughs> constant C. <laughs> so let's try to make that look a little friendlier. So the level curves of our function f are given by this for some c. And I'd rather rewrite this more helpfully. Anybody tell me what, what to do? Take e to everything, right? Mm -hmm. So exponentiating, what do we get? Everyone's just saying it differently. Times e to the c. Yeah. So you can just set the c. And you bring this there. And e to a constant is otherwise known as c constant. I, I reserved little c to be e to the capital C, oh, okay. e to the 1 over x, for some little c. So they, yes sir? Oh, um, in the homework problem, there's a problem just like mm -hmm. this. So can, if we guess instead of actually do the whole diffy q thing, because I like, I could q. Do you guess what the level curves were? Yeah. 
I guess you should at least verify that your guess is correct. Well, yeah, it, like I just took, I, I did a function g of t and then like had t. It's unless you have some justification <laughs> for what you're doing. I don't understand. If you couldn't have guessed, however, Matthias, this would be a good method to use. So, what do these level curves look like? And how does this solve the question? How do I know about little f just knowing its level curves? So, what do, the level, what do these look like? First of all, the absolute value of y means I have symmetry about the x-axis. So let's just figure it out for when, it, when y is positive, and then we'll reflect it. So what does y equals e to the 1 over x look like? The backwards to the x, right? So when x goes to infinity, I have e to 1 over a big number, that's approaching e to the 0, which is going to 1. So this is going to go to C as a horizontal asymptote. And when x approaches 0, it gets really large. So I have a, a vertical asymptote, looks something like that over there. And, and you could do a similar analysis on the other side. I'm only going to do the positive x's. Um, what happens down here? Well, you would reflect it and have the same picture here. That's the symmetry with the x of a of y. And it, when x is negative, what happens? Well, when x goes to negative infinity, it's, it's, it's y is, goes to 1 over yeah, it goes to b, which would be. It's still going to go to 1 over so you're going to go to 1, which means this is going to go to C, so it's on the other side. And what happens as x approaches 0 from the negative side? It goes to really, really small. It goes to 0. It goes to 0. So it actually goes something like that. It probably makes a... Because e to the negative infinity, as it were, is 0. E to the one, one over e to a huge number. All right, e to the negative one over x is one over e to the one over x. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So so if, so if this is approaching, if this is getting huge, one over it's going to zero. Okay. So that's sort of what the level curves look like for various c's. Yeah. It's very cool. so, what is that? so the question still remains. What does little f look like? That's so weird. It, it has to be a function. Now, you haven't done this kind of stuff, I don't think. I have to teach you something. So first of all, do you think that as I very little c, these curves fill up the plane? Well, we're missing the x-axis. Yeah. But what happens on the x-axis? We'll think about that separately, but don't worry about it yet. <laughs> so it feels like really what I want to know is a function on the line, say, x equals 1. If I know what my function little f does on that orange line, and similarly over here on an orange line, I will know what it does everywhere in the plane. So here's what I'm going to claim. So I'm going to take some arbitrary differentiable function. Setting 
my unknown function equal to that function when I'm at the point x equals 1 and whatever y should determine little f for, for all x, y in the positive Namely, I'm saying each level curve, I need to get my colors right, each level curve meets that line at a unique point. If you take an arbitrary point I'm going to stop saying that I'm in the first quadrant. Just, I'm just going to say given x, y, but I'm assuming I'm in the first quadrant. Can you figure out where the level curve through this point x, y is going to cross the line x equals 1? If, if you can, that's going to tell you what c value comes into there. So if this curve is, maybe I shouldn't. Let me, let me write it with capital X so we don't get confused. Capital X, capital Y. What, where, where do I cross, if this is the line, if this is the curve, Y equals little c, e to the 1 over X. How do I figure out what c I'm at when I cross the line X equals 1 here? Y over E. Y over E. So C is going to be whatever Y, X, and Y are, they have to satisfy this equation for my C. So I can solve for C and say it's E to the negative 1 over capital X times Y. Do you agree with that? Because that was divided by, right? If I take capital X here, capital Y here, and I divide, I solve for C. So if you give me a point, like 7, 10, I can plug in and find which level curve it's on in terms of this number. Well, now, if I only could tell where that level curve crossed this orange line, I would know what special y to plug into my function phi and tell you what the formula for the function is. So what is the y height at which this curve, with this value of c, m meets the line x equals 1. What, is the, what are the coordinates of this point if little x is 1? Um, if x is 1, first coordinate is 1, the first coordinate is 1, and then I plug into this equation and I find what y is. C times E. Oh, say, can you see? So, C equals E to the negative 1 of X. I just get C times C. C equals C. No, it doesn't. So, what should the value of my function be at this point if I know the value at this point is? capital phi of this. Should it be E1 minus 1 over x, y? It's capital phi of E, e times one. this c, right? Yeah. So if you, whatever function you have on this orange line, you plug this function of variables x and y into it, and that's giving you what the original f had to be. So given capital phi, which is telling you what the function's doing on that line, that's like the initial condition that you need to tell you what the function is. Every point on the plane in this, in this quadrant meets, can be gotten by some, taking some green level curve 
You know where that green level curve crosses this axis. You know what the function is here. You know that the function is the same on the whole level curve. So if you could just take your point that you're at and trace it back along its level curve to where the level curve crosses the orange line, you know what value your function has to have. So summary, f of x, y, I'm putting little letters in now, is capital phi of e to the negative 1 over x plus 1 times y. And we could check with the chain rule. What is the partial with respect to x? What is the partial with respect to y? How do I take the derivative of this awful looking thing with respect to x? Chain rule. So capital phi of blah, what's the derivative? Capital phi. Capital phi prime of blah times derivative of blah with respect to x. What is the derivative of blah with respect to x? E to the negative 1 over x plus 1 times 1 over x squared times y. Everyone agree? What's the partial respect to y? Phi oh, prime of blah times the derivative of blah with respect to y. It's just a constant. So let's see. Ask yourselves if I multiply this by x squared and this by y and subtract them. Yeah, it worked, right? <laughs> x squared times the partial respect to x does indeed equal y times the partial respect to y, as desired. And I'll let you think about what happens in the other quadrants. It's not hard if you've understood this. You need to sit down and think about it. OK? So. You can go brag to all your friends that you actually know how to solve some partial differential equations now. Useful for physics and engineering, and biological sciences as well. All right, so what we're going to do for the next few minutes before we quit today and then tomorrow is actually talk about some physics. So I actually want to talk about um, Kepler's laws. So maybe I shouldn't call it physics. What's, what's astounding about Kepler's laws so, is that Kepler figured all this stuff out centuries before any calculus was invented. All he had was lots of observations and log tables. Um, so Kepler also came up with a law that we no longer publicize because it was just wrong. <laughs> He, had, he, was, he was very taken in by the mysticism going on in the 17th century with platonic solids. I mean, everyone was raised reading the Greeks. And so there is this theorem that some of you may see if you take Math 4010, that there are five regular polyhedra. Do you know what those are? Shapes that are made out of congruent faces. You can have a tetrahedron, you can have an octahedron, you can have a dodecahedron, you can have an icosahedron, and you can have a cube. And it, it was understood way back when that those were all the regular shapes you could have. And Kepler was trying to fit them inside one another. I can show you a picture in another book. And he believed that the solar system actually put planets in a way that had to do with the way these polyhedra sat inside each other's. So we've forgotten about that because it turned out it wasn't too good, especially when there were more planets. Um, so, so, but Kepler, it, it's astounding. So he said that if you take any planet in the solar system of our sun, what is true? Well, every planet moves in an elliptical orbit.
with the sun at one focus. So, thank goodness, not an ant eater. <laughs> <laughs> here's the sun, and here's the any one of the planets in its own elliptical orbit. In particular, and then we'll prove this tomorrow, the orbit has to be a plane or it has to be in a plane. Right? An ellipse is a conic that's in a particular plane. So there is there are various planes that the various planets can be in. They are in different planes. And I'll ask you tomorrow what is going to determine what plane you end up moving in if you're a planet. Second law said that the planet moves along that orbit not at a constant speed, but in such a way as to sweep out equal areas in equal times. So, in particular, what do I mean by sweeping out area, or what did Kepler mean? You take the, you think of the sun as being the origin, you take the vector to the planet, as the planet moves, say in a day, it moves over here, and this would be the area that swept out in that day. On the other hand, if the planet were over here, to get the same amount of area in one day, what's got to be true? It's got to go a lot further. Whoops. Mm -hmm. It's going straight to the sun. <laughs> <laughs> it's got to be it's gotta do a lot faster to get the same area here in a day than it got there in a day. Of course, my day should probably be closer to a week or a week and a half or something. But. So we'll prove this tomorrow. And then the last one was totally crazy how he saw this. And by the way, if you're in, sufficiently interested in these, another challenge problem is to actually prove everything. <laughs> <laughs> all, the, all the steps are there, all you have to do is follow them like a good little mammy. Can we use the log tables? <laughs> no, you don't have to use log tables. So Kepler's last observation was that the period, the time it takes to go around once in orbit, the square of the period is proportional to the cube of the semi-major <laughs> axis. <laughs> you can see that. So you have an ellipse here. This would be your A. <laughs> so you can actually, the key to actually understanding this stuff is to sort of think more in polar coordinates, obviously. So what we will prove tomorrow is number two. And we're going to do it more generally than what Kepler was doing. Kepler, again, he was before Newton came along and presented Newton's law of gravitation. But Newton's law of gravitation says that the gravitational force exerted by the sun on the earth, say, is inversely proportional to the square of the distance and acts radially. So it points back towards the sun, and the magnitude is some universal constant times the product of the masses, I'll write this down tomorrow, times one over this distance squared. Yeah. We will show that number two holds for any, what is called central force field, for any force that's pointing radially on, along the line joining the sun and the earth. You don't need it to be inverse square for number two to hold. But for these to hold, you do need it to be inverse square. And that's left for you to do in challenge problems. Okay, so we'll pick up with this and do the math tomorrow. <laughs>